just to put some dimensionality around uh, the degree to which we are so engaging so many different partners and, and individuals who um, are part of our work who are not our staff. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have 700 uh, partner organizations that yeah. get food from us and distribute it in the local community. We engage about 30,000 volunteers a year uh, to help us pack food boxes or work in gardens or work out in our partner agencies. This is the Brandon Smith Show, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith. And the entire purpose of the show is one singular thing, and that's to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. So here we sit in uh, November, approaching Thanksgiving, and, and I was thinking about Thanksgiving, and I thought, you know, this is a time where we want to be thankful. And normally uh, what I do on this show during the years is I've said, let's practice being thankful. And I think that's important, and I want to honor that. But I really want to spotlight uh, those folks that maybe aren't going to have the traditional Thanksgiving that we would often think of when we think of Thanksgiving. And I want to help us think about thankfulness in a different way. How can we contribute to our communities and contribute to those folks that have a need during this time? So I have the wonderful pleasure of having Kyle Wade on the show. Kyle, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me, Brandon. It's great to be here. Yeah. So you are the president and CEO of the Atlanta Community Food Bank. I am, yeah. And I've gotten to know you and spend some time with you this year, and I'm just amazed at the wonderful work that you and your team are doing. So I thought it'd be great to kind of have you on the show and talk a little about the kind of work you're doing and the importance of that, particularly in this season when we think about Thanksgiving. I thought that would be a good time for us to just really spotlight that. Well, we appreciate the opportunity. You know, this is a really important time of year for, for us, and it's uh, particularly important for the People that we serve, you know, the food bank is one of the largest hunger relief organizations uh, in the country. Uh, we support a network of some 700 uh, community partners wow. uh, across 29 counties in Metro Atlanta and North Georgia. And through that network, we provide around 63 million meals. 63 million. 63 million meals every year to about 750,000 people. Wow. And so this time of year, I mean, those folks need help all year long, but this time of year is particularly difficult uh, for those families because if you think about it, you know, food is um, uh, at Thanksgiving a, a thing that brings us together. It's like connective tissue. It uh, is part of our family history. It's part of what uh, connects us to our communities and to others. And for the people we serve, not having access to food is also about not having access to uh, community and to uh, family and to uh, the kind of uh, social network that really helps all of us uh, feel valued and part of the larger world. See, it's, it's, that's what's so fascinating to me is I, ne- I wouldn't have thought of that in the first, the first thing I would think of. I would think of, gosh, Hungry folks that you know want food on Thanksgiving, but I forget about the importance of the community and that connective piece that food really serves. Yeah, it's uh, you know food brings us together, and we 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 think of food as kind of a tool that helps uh, strengthen community, strengthen families, give people a better opportunity in life. Uh, and you know, again, this time of year is just a, a, a time where that's particularly painful for the people that we serve. Now, the great news is that we can help. Uh, solve that problem, right? I mean, we can help provide food to those folks who need it uh, and really give them an opportunity to have kind of a Thanksgiving, um, to have other holiday moments that um, are a little more joyous and a little bit more optimistic than they would otherwise be. Yeah. So part of the purpose of this show is I want to make sure that we talk about not only the good work you're doing, but how we, as, as a community, both community of of uh, folks around this area, but also listeners anywhere in the world right, can help right, support right. you. But I also wanna have our listeners learn a little bit more about you and even as a leader, how you got into this seat. So kind of tell us that journey. What, what ultimately got you to sit in this seat of running such a, an incredibly impactful organization? Yeah, well, you know, I, I often say, you know, I've got kind of, this is the opportunity of a lifetime for me to sort of be in this role. I've been in the role about four years and I've uh, been with the food bank now about seven years. Um, you know how I got here. I'm a, I'm a, a I'm a public school kid from Mississippi. Uh, I grew up uh, in a family that wasn't um, affluent. Uh, we weren't poor, 
Uh, we were just kind of working class, and and so I never uh, myself uh, went without food. Uh, but we also, you know, were the kind of family that bought stuff on layaway and and uh, went on one vacation every year, maybe or every other year, usually in a car. Um, that said, I I grew up around kids who really. Um, uh, many kids who really struggled. You know, this was Mississippi, and um, and I played sports with folks who were in public housing, and often really struggled to have enough food to have mm. uh, opportunity in life. And I saw uh, in those early years, you know, the different kind of opportunities that were available to me uh, based on uh, my race, based on uh, the degree to which my family, my parents were invested in my education. Uh, compared to those other kids that I went to school with. And, and just they had very different opportunities in life, and that has led to different outcomes in life. Um, so that, uh, uh, I think, motivated me at an early age to want to make a difference, to help mm. level the playing field for some of those kids that I grew up with back home in Mississippi. Uh, I started out my career after college uh, with an organization called Teach for America mm -hmm. and taught for a couple years in Compton, California. I worked for Teach for America I spent some other time uh, in the nonprofit world. Um, I helped start an organization called Charity Navigator, which many people will know as uh, an evaluation, um, an organization that evaluates the financial health of other nonprofits. Mm. Um, and then after I did these things in the nonprofit world for a while, I went to a big corporation, the Home Depot, and uh, really spent seven years kind of learning some management skills that I felt like I needed to learn to really be impactful as a leader in the nonprofit space. and. Uh, that kind of paid off, but ultimately I wanted to get back to the nonprofit world. And when the opportunity came up to join an organization as respected uh, and um, effective and impactful as the food bank, you know, I just jumped at it and I, I haven't looked back. It, and it's really worked out well for me. And, and I'm excited about now where we're going at the food bank. Yeah. And part of the thing that is on your horizon is a brand new facility. Yep. Yeah. We're, <laughs> uh, you know, the food bank uh, is. 40 years old now. Wow. Uh, we were founded in 1979 by a guy that uh, uh, folks in Atlanta may know, Bill Bowling, who's just a kind of an iconic nonprofit leader uh, in the community. It was founded in the basement of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in downtown Atlanta. Hmm. Uh, and that first year, we distributed about 15,000 pounds of food. Wow. Um, uh, now, we distribute about 15,000 pounds of food in the first 15 minutes of the day. Every day, we distribute 300,000 pounds of food a day uh, at the food bank. Wow. Um, and we have outgrown our space. You know, we've been in a building for about 15 years. Uh, in those 15 years, we have uh, grown our output by about six times what we were when we moved into the building. Uh, and we're just, we're out of space. We don't have enough freezer cooler space to handle all the produce that we move now. Uh, we don't have enough dock doors. We don't have enough parking, all of that. And so we're moving to a brand new 345,000 square foot facility in uh, off of Camp Creek uh, down near the airport. And it's going to allow us uh, to really expand uh, uh, our impact, to distribute more food to more people more often, uh, to distribute more perishable items, to engage volunteers in a new way, to engage the community in a new way. And and it's been an unbelievable effort. You know, we've raised more than $50 million to make that happen. And uh, we're going to move in February. So, man, it's an exciting time at the food bank. Yeah, it's a really exciting time. Yeah. Okay, so here you are. It's a growing organization, a really impactful organization, a big organization, yeah. a complex organization. Mm. So as a leader of a nonprofit, what have been some of your big learnings or challenges that you've had? What have been some of your big surprises that you've like, gosh, this is a little, this is tricky and, and maybe even unique to the nonprofit space? Yeah, well, I, th I think the challenges that we have experienced um, uh, since I, you know, moved into this role four years ago um, have, are, are not necessarily unique to the nonprofit space. Um, and, and they're really challenges of kind of change management. Mm. Um, and I, I think, you know, we, as I mentioned, I followed in the footsteps of an iconic uh, founder uh, for our organization um, that had built this great, you know, foundation on which we could build. But there was a need to bring new energy, new ideas. Uh, it was an inflection point for the organization. And so we had to find a way to kind of think boldly about our future, uh, but to do so in a way that 
uh, as we stimulated progress, uh, to do so in a way that also preserved the core of who we are, you know, that held on to our values, that celebrated our history, celebrated the kind of heroes in that history, uh, and that helped bring along all of our different stakeholders, our staff, our volunteers, our partners, our board, our donors. Uh, and so finding a way to uh, navigate all that change management has been the biggest challenge that we've had. To, I mean, obviously, we have to grow our fundraising. We have to find new sources of food. Those are all uh, challenges. we got to find talent, um, and that's challenging uh, in this economy when uh, we have such a tight labor market. Uh, but uh, helping all of our different stakeholders kind of embrace the idea of a bold future where we're going to more than double again the food that we provide to the community, uh, where we get rid of some programs, add some new programs, uh, and also kind of hold on to the past. That has been the biggest kind of management challenge. Yeah, that sounds like it. And it's interesting because when I, one of the unique things that when I work with nonprofits, that can be more a little more of a challenge for them than maybe for profits. Yeah, is cutting programs. Yeah, no, I they mean, there's, there's an inclination of wanting to add more to serve more people or right. constituents, whether we're talking about a church or a school or a, right. or a separate nonprofit. But the idea of a cutting one hurts a little more because it feels a little more personal. I think. Yeah, and, and you know, and the sort of business case around programs is a little different in the nonprofit space for sure. You know, in the for profit world, if something's not sustainable financially, you know, just that is what it is. You got to move on from the business. In the nonprofit space, you know, there's an emotional connectivity uh, from our donors um, mm. and from our volunteers and from our staff in certain things that we've done forever and always. And to get folks aligned to the idea that, hey, this is not mission central, um, that we don't have the capacity or the support uh, to continue this program is is very challenging. We've done that in a couple of cases now. And I think what we did a great job of at the end of the day was we were very measured and deliberate and thoughtful about how we went through that change. We knew what we needed to do, but we listened a lot to the different stakeholders. Mm. Uh, and we also uh, were uh, uh, really resolved, if, if at all possible, find a new home for this program so the resource would not go away. For example, we have a school supply program called Kids in Need. That's a great program. It just It's not about closing the meal gap in our community. And so we work for a very uh, extended period, I mean, a couple years, to find an organization that could take on the program and make it better uh, and give it a new home. And, and we were successful in doing that. You know, I would never have thought about that, but that's such an important takeaway. Right. As a leader of a nonprofit, when you when, when you have to make those tough decisions on programs, right. and I think there's two things I heard in there. One, the, I cannot stress the importance of listening, right? Get, getting all those stakeholders involved because there's so many that have such a personal uh, and emotional attachment to everything that you do, right? And then two, it's not just you don't just cut it and kill it. You go f- try and keep it alive, but find a place where it can thrive. That maybe not maybe not in your four walls. Yeah, and you know, and I think it is going to thrive, and that's great news you know and the kids who and teachers who benefited from that program you know we want them to continue to have access to that Uh, it was really important for us to communicate throughout that process really uh, frequently and um, uh, you know and with transparency uh, to our different stakeholders to kind of bring them along through the process as well Uh, we had great outside support through that process um, to kind of do an assessment of the organization that was taking the program on to make sure that they could handle it Um, and i think the result of that is that it just has made the ending even though it took a lot longer um, much more successful than it would have been had we operated more quickly and and just sort of quickly gotten rid of the program that would have been much messier and harder to deal with on the back end uh, than it is now. And so, you know, we're fortunate that we've been able to navigate it the way that we have. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, I see we're getting close to break. So when we come back from break, uh, I've been just begging to ask you this question about the how do you kind of um, manage, lead, motivate an a, a organization that is so partner-based and so right. volunteer-based 
because that's a different kind of skill set, and I'd be really curious on what you've learned in that. And then I want to spend some time talking about what can we be doing to support you because you're doing such great work. There's got to be some things that we can be doing to really make you even better, not only this year but but, but next year. So uh, we'll go back. We'll go to break, and when we come back, uh, that's what we'll take on. So stay tuned. Here's your coaching minute for the week, presented to you by the Leadership Foundry. Dysfunction in the workplace, it's a pervasive problem. Here's a simple tip to eliminate dysfunction, both in your team, but even in the environments around you. Clarify your team members' roles, goals, and responsibilities. So just spend some time thinking about, does all my team know? Does each of them know what their role is, what the goals are of the team, and their responsibilities? If the answer is yes, you right there eliminate 50% of the, all the dysfunction that could come up in your team. If the answer is no, think about how you could do that better. When we don't do that, one of two things happens. Either people overlap work and they step on each other's toes, or you have one person carrying much bigger load while a couple other people are hanging out not doing near as much work. It's one of the big problems in the nonprofit world is a lack of clarity around roles, goals, and responsibilities. So focus on those three things and I promise you, not only will you eliminate dysfunction, it's going to make your workplace that much more enjoyable. Welcome back from break. Uh, this is the Brandon Smith Show, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith. And so we've been talking on the show today, specifically tied to Thanksgiving, specifically the good work that the Atlanta Community Food Bank is doing. And so I've been interviewing Kyle Wade, the president and CEO of all of the work you're doing, but we've been spending the most recent conversation on some of your evolution as a leader and some of your kind of learnings as a leader. And I set up right before break that I really wanted to ask you about um, any learnings you've had or tricks you found or anything that you've found as kind of a secret sauce in leading such a complex organization built up of partners and volunteers. Because my, my assumption is, if you thought about all the people doing the work, you've got, you've, naturally you've got employees that are very committed to the organization. Right, But right. you've got all these hands and feet that are volunteering to be part of it. So how do you, how do you, how do you hurt all those cats, is essentially my question. Well, I, I think, for, for one, it's really not about hurting. You know, I, I think, uh, just to put some dimensionality around uh, the degree to which we are so engaging so many different partners and, and individuals who um, are part of our work who are not our staff. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have 700 uh, partner organizations that yeah. get food from us and distribute it in the local community. We engage about 30,000 volunteers a year uh, to help us pack food boxes or work in gardens or work out in our partner agencies. Um, and of course, there are uh, thousands of volunteers who are working in those 700 partner organizations that never touch the food bank. And so the way we kind of think about, you know, how do you um, uh, help all those people be productive and impactful is, you know, the food bank is just kind of a platform uh, that allows people to make a difference. You know, our mission is to engage, educate, and empower the community to fight hunger. And, and, you know, we're a big food distribution organization. We distribute 75 million pounds of food a year. But there's nothing in that mission statement about trucks or warehouses so or cool. even food. You know, it's yeah. about community engagement. And, and so our job is to kind of give the community, uh, those partners, volunteers, others, tools, information uh, that allows them to, to be effective and impactful and making a difference around – solving hunger yeah yeah that's really cool and i th think that's such an important distinction because on the one hand we could look at your organization and say look at that supply chain network i mean it's kind of what it is right but it's really not about that it's about equipping people to make a difference in their communities and i love the way you frame that yeah and and it also informs then the way we kind of make certain decisions uh, about our organization so if we're presented with a decision about, you know, a change we want to make in our, um, the way we distribute food, you know, it's not simply about what's the right supply chain answer, 
Uh, it's about, is this going to also help our partners um, uh, be able to do their work better? Uh, and so everything we're thinking about in terms of how we're sourcing food, um, what kind of changes we make in our procedures and processes around how you order food from us, um, how we engage volunteers. It's, it's all about how are we um, ultimately making it easier for those different partner organizations that get food from us to do their work and have a and, and make a uh, bigger difference in the lives of the families that they serve. That sounds, that sounds like best practice in using either a purpose or a mission statement to really guide the organization and guide all the constituents. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you were, if Bill were here, the guy who founded the food bank, you know, he often talks about our work is about building a movement uh, and uh, kind of changing consciousness in the community. And I, and I, and I think I, you know, agree with that. I buy into that. You know, what we're trying to do is to get more and more people, uh, uh, engage them in the hunger issue, uh, help them be more aware of what are the causes, what are the uh, outcomes that are relate to food insecurity, uh, and then to and to give them the tools they need to be uh, uh, successful in making a difference. And uh, and so the more people we bring to the table uh, are, to have that conversation. Uh, and then to get them involved, and it doesn't even have to be involved with us. You know, it can be get involved in your local community in issues of housing, get involved in education programs, get involved in literacy, get involved in child care. You know, all these things connect. The, the food insecurity issue is not a problem in isolation. It's a problem of, um, uh, of, of, of poverty, yeah. ultimately. Uh, and and that is not the result of one thing. It's connected to all those other things. So, you know, one of the great examples that I would give of uh, of how we do this is uh, a youth program. So we have every year a youth summit where we bring high school kids uh, in for a week. It's just like a, a day camp that we send our kids to all the time. And they spend a week with us, you know, kind of all day, um, where they learn about food insecurity kind of in a classroom setting. They go out and work in our community garden. They uh, volunteer in our facility. They go visit some of our partner agencies. They go down to the state capitol and learn about public policy and advocacy and how they can get involved in that. And at the end of the week, they leave us having made a commitment for how they are going to address food insecurity in their local community. So you have high school students from Roswell, from uh, Lawrenceville, who go back to their community and do things like operate a food drive in their local community or start a food pantry in their high school or uh, start some other sort of public awareness campaign in their local neighborhood uh, aimed at solving hunger. And, and so the experience of the food bank then turns into um, something that just becomes part of what they do. And, th and that's really what our work is all about uh, for those kids and much, much more broadly. Yeah, that's soup. That's incredible. And a perfect segue into what I want to spend the remainder of our time on. So there's lots of folks listening to this right now and we're nearing Thanksgiving. Yeah. What can they be doing to either support you or your mission? Yeah. So the f place to start on that question is just to uh, acknowledge the fact that you know, one person can, in fact, make a huge difference. Hmm. Um, and, you know, a great example of that, of course, is uh, Bill, our founder, had an idea. I want to start a food bank so that more people can feed more of their neighbors. And then fast forward 40 years later, bam, we've got this amazing food bank network. Uh, similarly, there was a guy who um, uh, ran an apartment company. Uh, back in the 70s, started an apartment company and decided he wanted to feed hungry people in his in his local community with his employees. So they did a food drive, uh, took it down to a local church. The next year they did the same thing, got more food, took it to a couple different churches. He's like, man, this is kind of a mess to manage. I need somebody to help me. And he found the food bank. And then they started doing this food drive with the food bank and bringing us food. And he got so fired up about it. Then he started um, encouraging other people in the apartment business to do this. And now 40 years later, uh, this is the world's largest food drive where those guys raise more than a million dollars a year for us 
all because one guy decided he wanted to help out his neighbors. Wow. So one person can make a huge difference, and it just is about getting started. You can get started with us uh, as a volunteer. You can go to our website, acfb.org, and find ways to volunteer with the food bank. Uh, we certainly need your support financially. Uh, and we're, we consider ourselves to be one of the best philanthropic investments in town. You give us a dollar, we can turn that into close to four meals that we provide to people in need. Four meals. Which is an incredible wow, amount of uh, sort of efficiency impact. leverage for your dollar. Yeah. Um, and, and so you can do that on our website too, acfb.org. Uh, you can get involved with one of our partners and you can find those at our website. You can uh, become an advocate, learn about our sort of public policy work and uh, get involved there. Uh, and we have all kind of events. So a great event you can get involved in every year is our Hunger Walk, uh, which this year will be on March 15th. Uh, and you'll be able to start registering for that here in the next couple months. It'll be down at uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium at the Home Depot backyard there next to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. There'll be 10,000 people that come out and we'll do a 5K run walk. And together we'll raise a million dollars to help support hunger relief efforts in our community. So there's so many ways to start getting involved, and in it's just about taking that first step. You know, hunger is a really important issue. One in eight people in our state are food insecure. One, one, in, one in eight. One in eight. One in five of our kids are food insecure. Oh, wow. So these are kids who don't always have the food that they need, which means they don't grow and develop the way that they need to. They don't do as well in school. And ultimately, they are not going to contribute as much when they become adults unless we give them the food that they need. So um, you, the issue, despite our incredible sort of economic prosperity right now, remains significant. There are a lot of people who are still uh, not getting ahead despite this economy. And so we need all the help we can get and everybody can make a difference. So I'm hearing a couple of things we can do. We can we can start movements and get involved in that way. We can we can uh, volunteer and go to the, um, acfb.org and we can right. volunteer, we can, we can contribute financially uh, but then so there's a lot of ways we can plug in yeah i mean so if, if you go to church and uh if your church has a food pantry get involved there if you if your church doesn't have one well maybe start thinking about how do you start a food program yeah in your church even in a community like roswell you know there's need here absolutely uh, and uh, people may not see that but i guarantee you there's need um so there's an opportunity regardless of where you live uh, regardless of how much you've done before to make a difference. And we'd encourage everybody, go to our website. That's a great place to start. Uh, and just don't let anything get in your way. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the event on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Yes. What's going on here? So uh, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving has become kind of a national phenomenon called Giving Tuesday. Uh, and it's a, it's a time, it's kind of like you got Cyber Monday, you got Black Friday, Giving Tuesday is a way where people can really kind of uh, give uh, to charity. And uh, for us at the food bank, we've got a great partner, a company called Medlytics that's based here in Roswell. Uh, they're a great kind of healthcare related organization. Uh, and those guys, Arvind and Tony, um, have agreed uh, to uh, match donations that are made to us as part of our Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, uh, and so, for every uh, up to fifty thousand dollars, they're going to match every dollar that's contributed to the food bank. So it's an opportunity for you. You give us a dollar now; it's turning into eight meals because of the match from uh, the Medlytics guys. And so on Giving Tuesday, uh, right here after Thanksgiving, it's a great time to go to our website, make a contribution, uh, and it will make an even bigger difference than it would during the rest of the year. Yeah, that's wow. That's really powerful. And they, and you can do that on the website. So just do it on that day. Do it on that day, and uh, and it will uh, go toward this Giving Tuesday promotion. Yeah. So one last question I, I did want to ask you, too. Um, so some folks who will be listening to this right now, are all these things are exciting and inspiring to them. Uh, and they may say, you know, I want to do something that's team building with, with my team. I, I may be a director. I've got managers and other members of my team. or I, but I, And I want to do something that's team building but also volunteering. Right. Can, can people volunteer in, in groups? Most of the people who come to volunteer at the food bank do so in groups. And one of the cool things we do all the time is we'll have um, groups from companies uh, that will come and, uh, and volunteer together. Um, I did that when I was at Home Depot. You know, oh, fantastic. Uh, um, 
well, and I didn't even work at the food bank yet. And uh, and sometimes folks will will do that and have a business meeting at the food bank uh, as part of their thing. So they'll have a whole offsite day where they have a business meeting for a couple hours. We've got good meeting space for that. Uh, and then they have a three hour volunteer shift as part of it. And it just becomes this great team building activity. Uh, and, and we do that for groups big and small, you know, up to a hundred, uh, down to 10. And, uh, that's something that you can also, uh, contact us about on if, if that's something you're interested in. Okay. I think you've given us every single possible way to support you and get involved. <laughs> There's nothing I can think of that we're missing. Yeah. We've got groups, we've got individuals, we've got stuff we can do in our local community, we can right. contribute financially. Right. Uh, the Giving Tuesday is a great opportunity to maximize kind of the impact. Yep. So, so many things to help you really fulfill that mission of making our communities healthier, basically. That's and, right. And, and, and stronger and better. That's right. Fantastic. Well, uh, so we're nearing the end of our show here and I always ask every one of my guests this question. Um, what life hack do you have for us to help us live a life more free from dysfunction, either personally or professionally? Um, you know, so I've got three young kids at, at, at home, so my life is filled with dysfunction, Brandon. Um, <laughs> and so Kyle, I, I have three at home too. Yeah, so, um, so there are a lot of choices here. Um, I would say what's on my mind um, uh, lately um, is uh, – you know the thing. I, the advice I'm trying to give myself is uh, to take a breath, mm. right? And I, I think you know we're on this kind of treadmill race uh, at the food bank, which I think is what a lot of people are on all the time. Um, and that's certainly true at my house. We're constantly thinking: Are we doing enough for our kids? Are they involved in all the right things? Are we getting them, where, them to where they need to be uh, when they need to be there? Uh, and so you get in this sort of really tunnel vision, sort of what's the next thing, what's the next thing, what's the next thing, and you lose sight of what's the long-term sort of destination. And mm. so um, I think as the leader of my organization, as a, a, a contributor to that organization, contributor to my family, I'm trying to find ways to sort of take a breath, take the long view, maintain perspective, and understand that we're not gonna solve hunger tomorrow, we're not going to get my kids to college tomorrow. That this is a journey, and we need to, at the same time that we're taking a breath, enjoy what's happening today. That will make yeah. us um, have more energy for the long race we've got to run. Amen, brother. Amen. I love it. That's yeah. beautiful. Well, so you've already said it before, but let's just say it one more time. Ways people can can, can learn more about what the food bank's doing, uh, or contribute, or volunteer. Where can yeah. they go? So again, our website is acfb.org. Stands for Atlanta Community Food Bank, ACFB. That's right. Go there. Or, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, look me up on LinkedIn, Kyle Wade, W-A-I-D-E, and uh, um, contact me there. And, you know, we can get you hooked up to whatever opportunity uh, compels your imagination. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you for sharing the mission and giving us not only inspiration, but so many ways to be part of it. Well, Thanks for having me, Brandon. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We'll have to we'll have to do it again. Good. Maybe sooner than next Thanksgiving. All right. Uh, so thank you for listening and watching. Of course, keep up the fight every week as we try and make our, our work lives and personal lives more free from dysfunction. If you're not listening to us on iTunes, please subscribe and rate and review our show so we can get other folks to find the show and learn about the good work we're doing. And if you haven't checked out my newly updated and revised Workplace Therapist site, please do. You can just Google Workplace Therapist or go to www.theworkplacetherapist.com and you can find uh, past podcasts on there, blogs, articles, resources, all designed to help you. Uh, and uh, until our next show, not only have a wonderful Thanksgiving, but have a wonderful week and a great life. Mm-hmm.